combinación con un salto también fantástico de este hombre. But you know, Miles Rockwell, I, I would say, was probably the last of the great American downhillers when you know, he won Worlds in Spain in 2000. Curva contra curva, llegamos a la recta final, atención, atención, 355, 69, está cerca, está cerca, Miles Rockwell, está cerca, y lo bate, lo bate, esta prueba del descenso. And that was it for American downhill racers for a long time dominance wise until that Gwyn era so you're seven eight years later until he came on the scene but it wasn't probably 10 until he started doing those Gwyn things which was just shaking the sport like holy crap i feel like it's been a while you, know, you had the aussie invasion you had the french thing but one dude just rocking the sport In 2008, uh, at Mont Saint Anne, um, Aaron Gwynn turned up from the Yeti Regional Program and scored a top 10 in his first ever World Cup race. I wasn't there, I didn't have a team that year, but I had riders that I was working with at the time on his team calling me and saying, did you hear about that? Did you see that? Because back then we didn't have the Red Bull live coverage, so you'd have to get it secondhand. To be honest, a lot of people contact me when someone has a standout result, and I put it in the context of North America. Here's a guy that feels comfortable in that continent. Let's see what he does in Europe. Right now, okay, thanks guys, but it wasn't really on my radar. Probably a lot of the other riders had him on their radar, but I wasn't so sure just yet. And if we fast forward a couple of races, I was then in Schladming, for the finals and Aaron was there and he finished top 10 there, he finished eighth and that's when it clicked. This guy can ride Alpine racetracks and he can do Mont Saint Anne. Then he's got it, you know, that's when it clicked for me personally that this was someone important and then I discovered his background, you know, he came from the motocross, he moved over quite late and, and uh, Chris Conroy of Yeti had a sharp eye for this sort of thing and found a talented rider and by the end of 2009 he was on most people's radar, but still at that point he hadn't won a race, so you knew he could get on the podium, it's just how long was it going to take for him to win a race. And uh, for a team manager that's looking for a race winner to fill out their roster, you have to be pretty sure. I had a great years at Yeti, it was the perfect kind of starting program for me. Yeah, it was, it was a good time there, had some good results. I feel like I should have had my first World Cup win actually at Val de Sol 2010, yeah. And I, I was up on the, the top time by a couple seconds coming to the bottom, I had a big crash. But I feel like I would have won that race, um, but it just didn't happen. So I feel like all the pieces were coming together right at the end of that year and then we had a whole off season and um, I moved back here to California which helped because I was able to train a lot more consistently and kind of be in a familiar area and kind of get my program dialed. I hired John Tomac to be my trainer. Um, the team was really dialed, the bike was dialed, everything was great and I was just in a place of kind of maturity and fitness and everything where it was all kind of coming together. We went to training camp, he was looking very hungry. I don't think he went in with the expectation that he would win straight out but he always goes in to get the very best result possible and i felt like i had everything it took it was just going to take me a few more years of experience and getting my fitness up to shape and kind of learning stuff there were still kind of missing pieces but i felt like it was something that was definitely achievable and it was something that i it was a goal of mine for sure you know i wanted to try to win races so um yeah i was happy when it happened he had that look on his face when we went to the podium it was like yeah, we're on a roll now. This is this is where we're going. And uh, you could feel it. There was an energy in the team. Him and Tracy on the podium together. Tracy had won there two years earlier. It was a great feeling to start the season with that win, but none of us had any idea the domination that was to follow. Win is just on another level at the moment. No one can touch him. 2.113. Aaron Quinn takes his second win of 2011. What are they going to do about Cuddy? This is the new kid on the block. That meant a lot to me uh, personally, and I think for Aaron, they were going nuts. They had someone to pin a flag to. 
And soon after that, we had Wyndham and all these other things that brought momentum back to American racing and now the East Coast scene and different things are happening. But back then, it was a bit of a desert. So he broke through that ceiling that hadn't been touched for a long time, really since 2000, since Miles Rockwell won a world title. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually know that there was never a, a American World Cup champion until I think it was, I don't know, it was on the table for me to win it, I think. And somebody was like, you know, it's never been done before. And I was like, oh, sweet. So, um, yeah, it I wasn't something I was super aware of, but uh, it was cool. It's always cool to be able to be the first to do something. Yeah. Should have been more than that, too. I messed a few of those up. <laughs> well, you feel bad about that. Yeah, well, I crashed out of one, and a few of them I just rode like a dork. <laughs> That was a piece of history in itself when Aaron Gwynn went and won the overall series, the first American man ever to do that. Mike King had got a second and uh, Tomac had had a second, but no American man had ever won the Downhill World Cup series in, what are we talking about? We're talking about 19 years. The year that followed, I mean, he, he was even hungrier. I mean, he was aware now of what he was doing. And uh, yeah, so to win all those races, you know, nine races uh, in two seasons was, was an amazing feeling. Well, from an American Pride standpoint, it was super cool to see and watch, but more importantly, what he is doing from the American side of things is he is, and I see it happening, he is inspiring a new generation of, of, of the little guys, you know, like the eight, nine, ten year olds, you know, running around the pits in their little kits, like wanting to be like Gwen. So we haven't had that in a while. Sure, you've had American racers for kids to aspire to be and, and, and idolize, but they weren't winning and crushing the field like that. That gives you not just hope as an American fan of downhill racing, but just for the sport in general. So oh really, he said, you still can't really talk to him yet, can you? And he said, no, he said, this is your family. And he busted it up. I said, that's what it felt like, yeah. This, this, I was proud of everything he did and he just left me and that's the bit I didn't get. But now, after we've been together, I understand how it happened. So it makes a lot of sense. So we were, we were in the middle and there were big generals on horses while we were in the bloody dugouts telling us who to shoot at and what to do. And that's, that's the thing I didn't really enjoy. Um, hmm. It was a difficult time. And he wrote back the most generous email that anyone's written to me. And it made me realize that we weren't really the center of that problem that happened at the end of 2012. That was other players. And our friendship was still there. It had been covered up, but it was still there. Like a lot of companies in Germany grow with mountain biking too. Like that's a new generation of, of manufacturers. So that changed a lot, like, like now everyone is really into mountain biking and Germany is like totally, I would say, nothing, nothing to say bad about other countries, but I think we're pretty much on top of it. The German culture and the German bicycle business is a real, it's really hard to figure out. Because it is a powerful force, but it's, it's so, it seems so much more varied than other um, markets that we that we deal with you know I think that in Germany we such good um, we have such good value of money no one is like really 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 poor so it's more the mentality of snowboarding you know like let's meet with some friends have some fun and shred the philosophy was uh, just about the good times because that was the reason why I started mountain biking it was not going to contests or, or to races, it was just to go into the woods after work with, with the buddies, build some jumps and berms and just having fun and drinking a beer. This was the idea behind and I guess a lot of people uh, actually out there also are more focused on the good times. Good times are super important in life. Life is short and everybody should try to make the most out of it. So. We signed Lacan the guy because it was uh, part uh, of, of the whole story of the whole picture where we want to go with our philosophy and it still is, definitely. Um, the good times, like I mentioned, are the most important thing and um, that also means that you uh, can also be um, successful by doing this. And Rio is the best example of somebody who is just doing what he wants to do and he is enjoying his life to the fullest 
but he is still uh, super successful with it. Maybe because of that. Um, the reason why we needed a racer was because I was fed up uh, with the question, is your downhill bike able to win a World Cup race? At this time, our 2S uh, DH bike was one of the most successful uh, big bikes out there. We won the Rampage, um, Cam Sink was using it for the longest backflip in uh, history and our team riders did a lot of crazy and extraordinary stuff with the bike. But um, it never won an important downhill race. And now it was on, on us to prove that our bike really can win races. I was confident. I was confident that we have a world winning bike. It was a discussion over, I would say, two years or longer. And I was confident because it's obvious, it's clear, we also, we also test other bikes. Yeah, it's not just getting the feedback from, from, from magazines. Your bike is brilliant, uh, the bike is good, suspension works perfect, you could win a World Cup with this bike. No, we also checked other bikes. And uh, yes, with, with, that, with this combination, we were pretty sure that it's possible. So YT did like really good products and really good marketing. So that came on pretty well. And um, they've been right on time, you know, they made like super good marketing and I, the bikes are good, you know, and um, I mean, I think they pissed some people off, like direct sales, I mean, they, with direct sales you can probably do a product a little bit cheaper than the other ones and if you have like great marketing, you have more marketing budget and you can afford more riders. I mean that's a point too that they were totally into the sport like they were like totally into racing into slope style and they like uh, sponsored like cool riders. Oh yes we were super happy that we won so many bike tests for sure and that was was uh, one reason also why we developed so fast because we got a feedback from let's say all over the world from good riders from not so good riders from real experienced riders like Jones. <laughs> we just agreed to meet, just to meet up and catch up. What are you doing with your cars? What are you doing with this? How's your house going? But for us to meet, it wasn't something we could just do because if we sit down and talk from Monsanto and onwards, it looks like we're making deals. So we had to meet in a hotel room that no one knew and meet, walk into different times, different exits. And we sat down for an hour and it was a great chat. We just talked about what he's been doing and it became very clear to me that he'd matured those three years, that he'd learned a lot. He was now a businessman. He wasn't just a bike rider. He understood his net worth. He understood what he was bringing to the sport. And right at the end of the conversation, I was really tempted to say, do you think we could ever do that again? And I thought, oh, that's going to seem really opportune. You know, that's, 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 and I just did it. I just said, do you think we could ever do this again? He said, why not? Why not? Look, if this was, I was setting up a brand new team with someone that didn't have the pedigree and the, and the experience and the business skills of Aaron Gwynn, I might ask a few more questions. But like I said, when I met him in Mont saint -Anne, I was talking with a businessman. This was a guy in Mont saint -Anne who was throwing around what he thought he was worth salary-wise. And all the other guys were choking on their tongues. They couldn't believe he was asking that sort of money. Aaron knocked on my door and he said, I think I've got something cooking and I want you to run it for me. I was like, okay, then, then it's all decided, you know, it's all just fitting into place. I, I didn't know who it was, honestly. When he came to see me, he said, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but uh, what I will say is they're, they're young, they're dynamic, they've got some good ideas, they're from Germany. So, At this time, uh, there was only one option for us and that was Quinn, honestly. A lot of people thought, okay, Quinn is not really fitting to us uh, and, and to our brand. Um, he's uh, exactly the opposite of us, but I can tell you he is not. He loves racing and uh, he, he loves standing on the podium and that means the good times for him. So why does uh, it, it should not fit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the best racer in the world was trying our bike and uh, it could end up maybe in a mess. <laughs> so of course I was nervous. But um, after the first meeting with him, it was in September 2015, Stefan and me, we flew to uh, Andorra, to the World Champs, to meet him the first time uh, in person and ask if he's interested in um, riding for YT. At this meeting, I was super nervous. 
it was in a in a in a secret hotel room. Yeah, and it was funny because he was he was coming like uh, uh, like like Eminem but with a hoodie. Nobody should see him. And then we talked, and then we talked about the bikes, and uh, we talked about function. And then I was really impressed from the beginning on because he was he exactly knows what he wants. And uh, we also discussed the bikes he rode before and what was his feeling about the bikes. And, and we had immediately the same, the same lev technical level. The thing that was cool about the YT was when I got on it, um, and still to this day, it was, a, it was a bone stock out of the frame box, just like you would buy, you know, no modifications. And I, I loved it straight away. And then, then we sent him a tooth. Two or three weeks later, we got the message, and he said, "He said it's the uh, it's the Gwyn size. It's it's exactly exactly the the feel he wants to have on a bike. He feels home like from the beginning on. And I think that was the the, the most important statement. And then he was able to to find a the suspension setup, which was okay." Pretty, on a good level, also pretty fast. And that gave him the confidence to tell me yes. And so when we started setting up the new bike, we knew really where we wanted to go kind of straight away and how we wanted to do things and, and everything. So it was a really simple, easy process. We did put in a lot of days just to try kind of anything and everything, you know, air shock, coil shock, all kinds of different stuff to just find what I wanted. Um, but that, that process was pretty quick, so the testing was almost more... Um, we were trying to figure out which brake sponsor we wanted to run, component sponsor, you know, like everything else on the bike. So I was testing everything on the bike with back-to-back -back with a bunch of different brands for, for months before we, we dialed in on exactly what we wanted. I, I was scared. Obviously, yes, I was scared. It was a kind of pressure, of course, yeah, because um, this was uh, Judgment Day. <music> to see, okay, uh, is the bike really working in uh, racing conditions? And uh, does, he, does the bike really fit to him 100%? Uh, that felt for us uh, like being on the next level. Yeah, to, to standing um, beside all those uh, big brands, it was yeah, incredible. That a lot of people were questioning, you know, is this the right bike for Aaron Gwynn? And then you have Aaron Gwynn, who is who he is. I'm here to win. So it was a nice little cocktail of some doubt, some relief, and some enthusiasm to get going. And and we had the owners coming, so we had everyone from YT turning up. Because it was like everybody, everybody which, which, which has experience about downhill racing and the past and what happens on, on, with different bikes, with new riders and a team, uh, it was like, yeah, it could happen, why not? So we didn't expect that we have a, a, a podium at the beginning. It was a dream for sure. In, in my imagination, I had the dream that we are on a podium, but uh, no, not, not everything, no. When I came to Lawrence, I came to the to the team truck. It's the I saw the the team truck black, white team mop. Uh, everything was shining. You see the bikes, the mechanics working, and Aaron was there, and he said, "Hi." It, everything works like a Swiss clock. It, everything was dialed. Every minute was was under control. Martin Whiteley was the the director, the director of the weekend. And, and I came and Aaron was, was coming and said, yeah, great. Uh, he put uh, hands on my shoulder and said, yeah, great. And I was like, cool. Well, we were all pretty calm. I remember uh, Stefan being mega stressed out. He was the most stressed out of all of us. He was freaking out before my race run and I was just kind of like cruising around the pits getting my stuff ready. And he, I remember he was looking at me and he said something like, aren't you nervous? And I was like, I don't, yeah, like, I'm just gonna go do my thing, man. And he was over there like sweating it in the corner. I was like, just relax, it'll, it'll all be over soon, <laughs> so.
when it came closer to Aaron's run, it turned uh, into really, uh, really strong um, nervosity. It, I was so nervous. I shit my pants nearly, really. And the only guy who wasn't nervous was Quinn himself. It was so funny. Everybody was, oh my God. Yeah, when I look over at Willie, I mean, he's constantly holding his arms up like, what is actually happening? Am I really here? Is this really, is this really true? And Marcus just had this, he had a grin on his face. He just had a grin on his face. He was lapping it up. You know, this is a wonderful moment for people who've, who've created this brand and turned up. And here we are at race one. We're in the hot seat with one rider to go. It was incredible. It was a really, really special feeling, standing in the middle of the crowd. Uh, at Lords, they played really hard electric music with hard beats. And then Luc Bruni was on the track. And I, I remember that, um, that Luik came, came after Gwyn. Frenchies were crying, shouting. You were crying? Uh, I was standing in the middle. I was saying nothing with Marcus. Marcus and me were standing in the, in the middle of this crowd. And you hear the beats like boom, boom, boom. And uh, he was so fucking fast. <laughs> he was so fucking fast. And uh, my whole body was... was shaking and I was super nervous and then in the first corner where you see Bruni was a bit loose yeah a little bit loose I was like fuck and he was fast and I was like oh okay but it's already a podium yeah. I was like wow but you have this mixed feeling between is the guy holding the speed it looks loose it was one one part which looks a little bit loose. The rest looks pretty confident from this, from Lebrunny. Amazing. And I was like, yeah, we have a podium. Yeah. And uh, and then the moment when he was crashing. Then he crashed, and it was like uh, because I like um, Lloyd a lot. He's a super nice guy, and uh, on the one side I, I I had tears in my eyes for him, but on, on the other side I said yes. And, oh, it was whew, mixed feelings. And then the whole crowd was like, ooh. And inside me, I was like, oh my God. And then, then, then you could not stand in the crowd with Frenchies and could say, yeah. I was like, it was like, okay, now I want to scream and cry. But I was like, okay. I looked at Marcus, Marcus was like, oh. And uh, after the ceremony for, for getting the podiums and everything, then I went back to the, to the pits and then I was, uh, was crying, yeah. It's, it's a piece of uh, history for us. It's a piece of mountain bike history and uh, now we can afford to keep the bikes and not sell everything of them. Basically the dream, the dream comes true because the feedback we got out of this race team it's, yeah, you, you could not pay it with money. It was just a wonderful feeling that they'd made history. Not only had they won a bike race, but they'd won the very first World Cup that YT had entered. That's, that's just, and, and, and like you say, people out there saying, you know, it's a direct sales bike, it's this bike, it's that bike, it's a race bike, and it won a race, and it's, that, you can never take that away. That, that race is there for, forever, so I can't think of another brand that's done that.